Oh, uh, Brian or Ben, somebody, can you hear me? Yes. Hey. Uh, ben, um, well, I don't have any trouble referring to the USPAP book itself. I think we ought to steer clear insofar as possible from the seven hour update book so that yep. nobody thinks we're trying to give the seven hour update class. No, no, no. And, and we, we won't. Uh, we just went live. So uh, we are streaming now and we'll be getting started promptly in 10 minutes. Um, but just so you know, we uh, for the folks waiting, we are live, uh, Tim. And uh, I, I agree with you. So we will we will stray away from that. OK. Hey, Tim, can you hear me? Yes, Brian, can you hear me? I uh, gotcha. Okay, good deal. Diana took a little step out. Yeah, she took a little break. She'll be right back. Great. How's things going down in uh, Florida? Wonderfully. How about with you? I'm doing well, doing well. Good. Had a little bumpy road last night, but doing a little bit better now. The weather, we it teased us. The other day, it was like 80 degrees. <laughs> Are you? I, are you I was kidding down in me? Nashville, and uh, I actually had a, an instructor helping me. So I was actually able to say, I'd love to stay for the rest of the class, but I'm, but I'm not going to. <laughs> so I, I got to head out a little bit early and head back home. There's Miss Diana. How are you doing today? I think I am doing well. Thank you, sir. Good. Good. Diana, well. Diana was sharing a recipe of uh, crawfish mac and cheese. And it oh sounded wonderful. It was so oh good. My it was it so, amazing. so good. So I went to New Orleans uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Um, first time I'd been there. And the food was just incredible. Uh, we took a cruise last year and we, we went out of New Orleans. And so we were only there for, for one day uh, before the ship took off. We decided to take a cruise right during hurricane season. I mean, that's just us. You know, we, <laughs> five five hurricanes chases chasing us around a little bit. Oh my and, gosh! Um, but but yeah, the food is just incredible there. I, I could eat that every day. I so let me share with you something, and it is the gospel. If you come to Lafayette, you will find that the food is superior to that of New Orleans, wow. because this is the Acadiana. So this is where, like in, in New Orleans, you have uh, the Cajuns, but there's, it's a different blend than the Cajuns here. They, they, uh, so they have more Creole in New Orleans, which is tomato base, but here they do not have as much like that so it's just but the food is i mean it's just unbelievable mm. here so there's I, I don't think you can get a bad hey tim that that to me that sounded kind of like a challenge so if we've got any friends watching in new orleans and you know they want to challenge miss diana to a cook-off uh i'll be the test taster. <laughs> yeah well I'll, I'll be happy to uh to test that for everybody diana yeah, it's uh, good. I love New Orleans. I do, and I love their food. And I spent many. <laughs> I have eaten many a meal there, but I, I gotta tell you, I, this is like a little New Orleans here. It just is, you know. And you've got all the, the little towns, under, you know, and surrounded. Like I said, my friend, uh, she is a pure Cajun, and, and when she cooks, sometimes, and I'll say, "Teach me how to do that. Teach me how to do how you make that." You know, and she'll she'll start, and then sometimes she'll break into her French. I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! I I don't get that. You know, you gotta go, <laughs> gotta dial it back a little bit." Because she gets so it's they very uh it's a wonderful food here, and mm. they're just very happy here. They're just a happy, happy people. 
I like happy people. So, Me hey, too. before we uh, get kicked off here at 10 o'clock, and we'll start right at 10 o'clock. We've got people chiming in um, already. So good morning, folks. But uh, we, we officially start at 10. So uh, while we're waiting another four to five minutes to, to kind of get started today, uh, why don't each of you just tell me what's going on? I mean, um, I know both of you travel around a little bit, Tim. I, I bumped into you up in uh, Wisconsin one time. We were both lecturing in West Palm Beach at a board meeting, and and I saw uh, Miss Diana out in Vegas. And I know she's in Texas a lot. So, uh, if you've got anything kind of on the upcoming calendar, Miss Diana, what uh, what's going on in your world right now? Well, in terms of Texas, where I am, they're still reeling from uh, the disasters that, you know, it, it's just been about a year uh, since uh, hurricanes and all. So, so they're still dealing with the aftermath of that. Um, some of them are questioning, you know, where are we headed in the future? They're, they're, uh, I think a lot that's being discussed right now are these hybrid appraisals mm, that yeah. uh, seem to be a, a big discussion going on. Sure. Uh, sure. There is a little hesitancy here in Louisiana on that. And I will say today is our D-Day uh, in Louisiana. We are up in D.C. right now fighting the FTC with the complaint about the legislation towards AMCs and their fees. Uh, you know, we got sued, the state did. So, uh, so we've got that and all of us are kind of hanging on to see what happens. We're hoping that, um, that it's a favor in the state of Louisiana because we're very pro appraiser here. And that was part of the issue. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hey, um, and I know you did a course down in Texas on uh, disaster. I did. What to do for appraisers? What you know? What do we do during that process or after that process? And so we're we're hoping maybe we could twist your arm and, and maybe get that at some point online. So yes, I would be. And there's constant information. I mean, even going into that class, I brought some information that came in uh, not only December the seventeenth. But also the day before, uh, the day I was actually leaving to go uh, with some information that came in. And then I saw yesterday that FHA has some information. So this particular last disasters that we've been dealing with, in fact, I, I showed a map. Uh, there were out of the 50, we had 50 states and a territory. And out of that, 88% of our country had over the last year, one year, suffered from a major natural disaster. Oh so 88%. when you eighty eight percent had been oh, declared amazing. national by the president natural disaster areas. So when you think of it from that perspective, it's far more reaching than what we perceive. Sometimes we hear, you know, oh, here comes the hurricane. Oh, there's the fire. And then we just kind of let all of that go. But it's actually happening all over. And it's been a huge impact on appraisers. And really, on even those states that don't, because if you think about it, in the restoration of these devastated areas, you got to have a lot of wood got to have a lot of nails, yeah, got to have a lot of concrete. So the cost of materials mm -hmm. has also impacted new construction Absolutely. and even in areas where the disasters didn't hit because yeah. of the supply and demand that's going on. So that starts bringing in also that aspect of why is the cost approach showing such a, why does it cost so much to build? Well, that a lot of it has to do with the labor because you've got mm -hmm. all these labor forces going to where these disasters are, as well as the supplies. So it, it touches everybody. You know, the interesting thing with that, and Tim, I haven't forgot you. We'll get to you uh, in a minute, but we're about to kick things off. We've got about a minute. So I'll come back to you and, and have you kind of update everybody on your travels and where you're going to be. But, you know, the interesting thing with what you said, Miss Diana, is that. We, we suffered a tornado back in the year of 2000. I can't believe that was almost 20 years ago. It seems like it was last week or so. Mm -hmm. And we had about 300 houses knocked down. And, and thank the good Lord, no one died in that event. It was quite amazing. But the interesting thing is when we've had our ice storms and, and actually even in Kentucky, we were uh, impacted by a hurricane. 
folks would say, well, I'll go get a generator. Well, good luck. You're not going to find a generator. Well, right. I'll drive down to Nashville. I'll drive up to Evansville, Indiana. They're out. They're gone as quickly as they come in. So, hey, guys, it's 10 o'clock. So let's get started. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm Brian Reynolds with Appraiser E-Learning. We're excited that you're here today. And we're excited that I have two of my friends who happen to be very, very intelligent AQB certified USBAP instructors. So I am tickled to death to have them both here today. And we're going to kind of be talking about USBAP. Uh, we'll allow you to ask some questions. And before we get any further along the way, I'd like for them to say hello, kind of introduce themselves quickly to you, and maybe even give you uh, their contact information. So, Mr. Anderson, if you don't mind, why don't you go ahead and start? Tell everybody who you are, what you do, and how they can reach you. Brian, thank you. I appreciate it. And a good morning to you, and a good morning to Diana, and a good morning to everybody out there watching us today. Thank you for tuning in. You're in the right place. We may not discuss anything particularly important, but we're going to have a lot of fun, and I think you'll <laughs> enjoy the fun we're going to have. My name's Tim Anderson. I live in Florida. I am a USPAP instructor. I've been practicing appraisal for so long that if I keep practicing, I may eventually get it right. And I do a lot of consulting work with uh, my fellow appraisers who have found themselves on the wrong end of that letter from the State Appraisal Board. If you need to consult with me about it, if you just want to uh, vent and rant up, I'm good for that too. You can call me at 561-635-5265. My email address is maitca at bellsouth.net. My fees are reasonable and I'll be happy to chat with you. It'll be wonderful to make a new friend. Diana, what's going on with you? Well, I'm here in Lafayette, Louisiana. I also help appraisers on uh, when they find themselves in a crunch. And it can be from the state, it can be from Fannie Mae, it can be from lenders, and you do the same. And I, I am so glad that we have the opportunity to help appraisers before they respond. The challenge, of course, is when they say, well, I responded and now I've got this uh, penalty and I don't know what to do with it. And I was like, we'll serve it well, because there's not a lot you can do once the decision has been made. You need to contact us at the point you get the letter, not, not after you have addressed the issue. Um, my phone number is 210-363-5950. It's a Texas cell number because I got my cell many, 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 many years ago. Uh, right as soon as the big old bag phones converted to the smaller <laughs> phone. So I just have had it forever and I never changed it. But I live in Lafayette, Louisiana. Great, great. Well, welcome both of you. I'm, I'm so excited that both of you took time out of your busy schedule to be here with me today. We've got a lot to talk about. As Tim and Diana said, uh, I do a little of that as well, consulting for appraisers that get in trouble, whether it be a, a litigation issue or a, or more importantly, I think most appraisers are, are, are dealing with regulatory issues. And uh, we, we all three provide similar services in that regard. And I'm not going to ever tell you not to get an attorney, probably a wise decision. But I'll tell you this, I was an investigator for the state of Tennessee for a few years. And I can't tell you how many times somebody will grab an attorney and bring them in and, and think they're going to have success and they lose. Because attorneys, while they know the law, they typically don't know what you and I know. They don't understand what creates value, what effects value. And the topic today, they certainly don't understand this document, USPAP. So with that being said, we're going to kind of dive into our subject matter. I would uh, like to remind folks that if you're watching and you have any questions for any of us, uh, feel free to type in a question. We're going to try and get to as many of those as we possibly can today. And if we can't get through all of them, uh, hopefully one of us will reach out to you personally and, and help you with the issue or, or question you have. Now, that being said, we certainly don't have all the answers. <laughs> so there are times where I simply say, I don't know. Uh, let's, let's grab somebody smarter than me. And thank goodness today I have two of those folks here with us on the webinar. I would like to say that each of us are AQB certified USPAP instructors. 
However, we are here today offering our own opinion. We're not here on the on the behalf of any board or, or regulatory agency or, or anything else. It's just us as individuals really just offering our opinion. So I'd like to say that Appraiser E-Learning or Brian Reynolds doesn't necessarily agree with all opinions shared today and that you as an individual appraiser or user of appraisal services should verify research and make yourself feel warm and fuzzy about that through an authoritative source if you have a question, okay? So now that we kind of got that out of the way, one final thing I wanted to touch on before we kind of get rolling is Appraiser E-Learning is so excited to be partnering up with the National Association hey, of Brian, Appraisers. Hey, Brian, one second. Of Brian, I hate to interrupt. We, uh, we're having an audio issue. I want to make sure, I've got some viewers saying that we don't have audio. Give me just one second, okay? All right. We'll give you a second. Boy, when you hear that voice from behind the curtain, I don't know if he's back here or where he's at, but uh, you just kind of look around. I knew that wasn't. Let's see what we find out. Looks like he's frozen. No, he's he's good. I can hear Diana. I can hear Tim. I think I can hear. I Tim. couldn't hear you for a second, but I mean, you froze. It's like the screen. Well, you know, you weren't saying anything, but your picture kind of stood still. It's like when a storm comes there it and is. it says, sorry, the Hang signal's on. lost. <laughs> well, you know, you weren't saying anything. But your picture kind of stood still. It's like when it yeah, I'm, I'm hearing feedback on Ben now. Okay. So I've got other people that are saying they have audio now. Uh, so Oliver, hang tight. You got audio? Okay. Uh, ben, we're getting some endless feedback from you. Okay, thanks. Sorry about the inconvenience. <laughs> We have audio now. Sorry. Continue. Okay. So uh, you're going to have to cut that, Ben, because I'm hearing everything. Oh, thank you very much. So I guess you're back with us. And, you know, it's interesting when you watch a show and you lose audio or you see somebody's lips moving and then you hear the audio catch up. I don't know if that's what we had or not. But uh, the last thing I was trying to say is that Appraiser E-Learning is really excited. We're, we're partnering up with the National Association of Appraisers and we're having a conference in Nashville, Tennessee. So we would love for as many of you to join us as possible. Uh, actually, I'm going to give you a promo code good for $50 off. I mean, that is a heck of a deal. So if you use promo code AEL2018, you can get $50 off. And uh, we hope to see you in Nashville. We're excited. We're going to have some fantastic speakers, some folks from the Appraisal Foundation, I believe, the Appraisal Subcommittee, and a whole host of folks. So let's just dive into the subject matter because the three of us are talkers and we're limited to an hour today. So I want to make sure we get going and cover as much material as we can. So I'll start with you, Diana. You know, we're talking about USPAP and we, we promote this as talking about USPAP changes and there's significant changes um, and then some kind of minor changes uh, for clarity purposes. And this certainly is not going to take a place of somebody's seven hour use map update class per se. So we, we certainly don't have enough time to cover everything in depth today. But uh, Diana, what are some of the some of the major changes that kind of got your attention or maybe when you're teaching the update class, some of the most common questions that you get about some of the most recent changes or use map in general? Well, I think, of course, some of the more obvious changes that they will notice is that standard three has now been divided into two standards. It's and standard six has now been divided into two standards. Standard three used to be all inclusive uh, for the review and it pertained to real property and personal property. Now we have three and four and then we also have uh, mass appraisal, which was always inclusive development and reporting in standard six, but now it has development standard five and 
reporting standard six. And the reason that was done was for consistency. They had those two vacant spots for a few years. That was when we used to have appraisal consulting that had been retired. The discipline had been retired. And so it was kind of a placeholder, but it didn't hold anything. So they decided that for consistency with all of the other disciplines that it would be a good idea to separate those two. So for those of you who refer, who do reviews and refer to your standard uh, and standard rules in your reports, you need to really pay attention because that has changed. Yeah, absolutely. So now you're developing your appraisal review in, in, uh, in compliance with standard rule three and you're reporting the appraisal review via standard rule four. So yeah, we need to keep that straight. Uh, I just kind of made it consistent with all the other disciplines like real property. We had our appraisal development as standard rule one. We had our appraisal report as standard rule two. So they just kind of changed that to make it consistent throughout the entire document. Now all of our dis disciplines are exactly the same. You have development, and you have reporting. And so it just kind of makes sense to, to clean that up. Tim, what are your thoughts? I mean, what are some of the changes that kind of reached out and grabbed you or, or maybe the, the areas of concern or question that appraisers have? Well, Brian, thank you. And Diana, thank you for uh, making us aware of those changes. Uh, obviously, we're looking at a situation where the essence of real estate appraisal is beginning to see a, a a significant change. I'm going to call it a, a, a tectonic shift as more lenders switch over, excuse me, uh, as more lenders switch over to not either not needing or not wanting full appraisals, uh, but rather using uh, evaluations or so-called uh, hybrid uh, appraisals. And the point I wanted to make on this issue was that uh, appraisers need to be careful in the sense that USPAP says that an evaluation is uh, an appraisal and therefore must uh, correspond with standards one and two. The exceptions to that, however, are if state law indicates that an evaluation is not an appraisal. And uh, Brian, I'll look to you for a little, a little bit of wisdom on this. To my knowledge, uh, the states of Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, and if I recall correctly, Indiana, have specifically said in state statute that an evaluation is not an appraisal, does not have to correspond with USPAP, therefore an appraiser can do an evaluation as an appraiser, but yet not Fault, not need to follow the USPAP document. Are you aware of any other states that have that exemption or uh, did I get those four states incorrect? You know, Tim, I'm, I'm really not sure. I know Tennessee has that. And again, we would encourage our viewers to check that out on their own. Uh, if you have any state statutes that allow an opportunity for you, I will say this and, and let the appraiser community know that, you know, when Fannie Mae and USPAP bumps heads, USPAP wins. When law and USPAP bumps heads, the law would win. So that's what Tim's referring to. If, if you're in a, in a state that that has a law, uh, for instance, Tennessee, I believe has a law and I'm not, I'm not an attorney or a judge and I encourage you to check it out on your own, but I believe they have a law that says they're not going to discriminate against you because you happen to be an appraiser. In other words, uh, you, you could proceed and do those. So that would indeed be a jurisdictional exception if you have a law allowing you to do that. So uh, again, I'd like to remind our viewers that we are taking questions. So you can type in a question and we'll try and get to as many of those as possible. Uh, we'd like to try to stick on USPAP as best we can. I'll tell you an area for me that I've seen a lot of, a lot of little issues on, and uh, I'm going to actually share my screen a minute uh, when, I, when I get in there. But I was asked my students, so how far back do you have to analyze prior sales of the subject property? And I normally get the correct answer, um, three years, right? Uh, and then I proceeded and say, well, how far back do you have to analyze prior sales of the comps? And what do you think I hear more often than not? 12 months or one year, right? 
Right. Well, that's not a USPAP issue. USPAP doesn't require that. And then I'll then I'll just for fun add another one in. How far back do you gotta analyze listings of the subject property? And I typically hear 12 months. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of share my screen real real quick. I don't know if you guys can see me okay. Um, but what you're going to see, if if you can see me okay, is this is the actual USPAP document. Can you see that, Tim, Diana? Yes. Yeah, yeah, very clearly. Okay, great. Okay, great. So this is this is USPAP. You can see down here at the bottom it says USPAP. Uh, and I'm in standards rule one dash five. And it says when the value opinion being developed is market value, an appraiser must, that's a pretty important word there, must, if such information is available in the normal course of business, analyze all sales of the subject property that occurred within three years prior to the effective date. And then you can see it goes into standards one six after that. It doesn't say anything about the comps. And that's because USPAP doesn't require that. Now that may be a Fannie Mae issue, but it's not a USPAP issue. And then we, if we come up, up here and look at standards rule one five A and we look at it real closely, it says analyze all agreements of sales options and listings of the subject property when current. If, it doesn't say within the last 12 months. Now, that information may be important and, and, and useful and beneficial, but it's not a USPAP issue. And then finally, the question is, do you have to analyze all sales or all transactions? As you can see here, the USPAP document says sales, doesn't it? So let me, let me pull up um, one other document here, if I can uh, figure this out. I don't know if that's a, a, an area that you guys have um, folks question quite a bit, but it is for me. Um, well, I, I will but, tell you that. Oh, I'm so sorry, Tim. I apologize. No, Diana, please go ahead. If you'll notice when you had your screen up, there was a footnote. And the footnote also brought you to advisory opinion number one. There was a significant amount of change this year in this edition that came to that particular advisory opinion. Now we all know advisory opinions are advice. That's what it is. Right. But it typically references, of course, some part of USPAP. When you get through uh, using, you know, looking at that form and talking about it, I'd like you to pull up advisory one because I would like to show uh, the people Absolutely. who are listening that part of the document that is uh, not used pat but guidance to the document so that we can see Absolutely. where the ASB has re elaborated on that. Yeah, I'll pull that up uh, in just one second. And Diana brings an excellent point on that. Can you guys see the document I have on the screen now? Yeah, yes. the URAR, yeah. Okay, great. Um, first of all, I just wanted to show the difference. Okay, so if you look down here at the bottom of the second page of the URAR, the document we fill out as, as residential appraisers every day, you can see it says date of prior sale slash transfer. My research did not reveal any prior sales or transfers. So while Fannie Mae may be asking for sales or transfers, USPAP is only asking for sales. So if I'm doing a non Fannie Mae appraisal, I do get a copy of my report and I didn't analyze a, a transfer. Don't beat me up because I'm not required to. Now, depending on my client and intended user, that may be useful information, um, but it may it may be irrelevant. You know, if I'm appraising for a, a homeowner who's thinking about selling their house, they know they had their house listed eight months ago or something like that. So why am I wasting why am I wasting my time and their money? to tell them something they already know. And then finally, I want to I want to bring you guys in and I think this is what what Diana was about to lead to with the advisory opinion. Many appraisers do this. They say the subject property sold last year for $150,000. Period. That's it. And that's not good enough. You're just stating something that factually occurred. What you're required to do is analyze that sale. Diana, is that what you were talking about? Well, yes, a little bit. But actually, this is the first time that I have ever known the ASB to impart communication about the comparables. And so that's why I wanted to 
pull up advisory one and I can try okay. to share it on my screen if you want. Yeah, you know, I got okay. it. Give me give me one second. And then uh, when you get there, go to the bottom uh, very last paragraph. It begins with, of course, line 34. Okay, Diane, I've got it. All right, and then the second sentence, notice it says, just as the appraiser must analyze pending and recent sales of comparable properties, it's the first time that we get into that issue. Uh, okay, Diana, you, you broke up. Go ahead. Why don't you read that again? What line out item are you on? I'm, I'm on actually number 35. I mean, it's, it starts with 34. Okay. Go ahead. Says the, uh, the requirement for the appraiser to analyze and report sales history and related information is fundamental to the appraisal process. Just as the appraiser must analyze pending and recent sales of comparable properties, the appraiser must take into account all pending and recent sales of the subject itself. So it's the first time that we see them actually going into that arena because that is not what comp what Standard Rule 1-5 said. Uh, it also goes into uh, an elaboration that says even though the, uh, they and they say it, this is not to say that the appraiser must take into account all pending and recent sales of the subject itself. So they've left the comparables. The agreed price in a pending or recent sale is Necess is not necessary. What is it? This is not to say that the agreed price or recent sale of the subject property is necessarily representative of value or defined in the report, but the appraiser's failure to analyze and report these facts may, not must, may exclude important information from the sales approach, information pertaining to the current market status and connecting word. And then you go to the next page and it says sales history of the subject property may also be useful for the determination of highest and best use or analysis of market trends. So we have an elaboration here that we never had before that uh, is pulling in one a reference to comparables uh, and, and their pending information and their history. Uh, and then it's tying into that the sales history may have an impact on highest and best use. So I am saying to the appraiser, pay attention to what, even though this is just guidance, pay attention to the expectation. And the reason this all came about was the, uh, the regulators, the state regulators per se, were they were somewhat in a quandary because you would have appraisers say, well, this isn't part of USPAP and this isn't required. And then they would say, but shouldn't it be required? And, and, and how can they provide sufficient information for understanding if we don't get it? And then the argument always came back, well, you don't get it because we didn't write it to you. We wrote it to our client. So this is the first time where we're seeing the ASB start to enter into uh, offering guidance about more to be written about this whole analysis process that we did. And that is why the assignment results became such a big issue now, because they wanted to see more elaboration on that subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one other area that I want to uh, touch on real quick, and then uh, then we can go down any road you guys want to yeah, go. Brian, um, Brian, can I jump in there for a minute? Uh, first of all, uh, everybody, please understand that Diana is quoting from the 20, uh, uh, 2018, 2019 USPAP. If you're dealing, if you've still got the 2016, 2017 USPAP, it, the line numbers uh, are, do not correspond. Is that uh, what I had up there? I'm sorry. Did I have no, the wrong? No, you no, you were looking at the you were looking at the 2018, 2019. Uh, no, you were looking at the at the right version. Now, the issue I wanted to make was uh, the one in in line 34. The requirement for the appraiser to analyze and report sales history and related information. Blah blah blah. The point is the analysis. We're not required merely to report the sales history but to analyze yes. the sales history 
Then in summary form, in, a, in a, your typical appraisal report, then in summary form, summarize the results of that analysis. Now, uh, an, an appraiser is going to say, well, it was a divorce. It was for $10 and, a, and other good and valuable consideration. What is there to analyze? The point is what there is to analyze is the fact that that was a sale that is obviously not an arm's length transaction, therefore gives a lousy indication uh, of the market value of the property. But USPAP doesn't say analyze all the sales except the divorces and the intrafamily uh, transfers, et cetera. It says analyze all of the sales and then right. uh, report on that. And it's the analysis that the appraiser tends to leave out. The reporting tends to be there. It's the analysis that the appraiser leaves out. And the analysis is, I looked at the last sale, it's recorded at, uh, 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 the deed is recorded at book and page thus and such. It was for $10, another good and valuable consideration. Therefore, it was not an arm's length transaction right, and does right. not aid in uh, concluding as to market value. Let's go to the next sale. That's the analysis and the reporting. Merely saying it sold uh, uh, 18 months ago for $300,000 and is recorded at book and page la da is merely a statement of fact. There That's is exactly no right. analysis and there is no summary of that analysis. Let me let me put uh, an, an yeah, example also, of that up on the screen, this, okay? Sorry. I, I want to put an application. I'm going to put a uh, a copy of what Tim was talking Thank about you, on the screen really because that's it. That's exactly the point I was making earlier. And guys, I I taught a class just two days ago, and I had three students say, "I'm guilty of that." You know, that's all I I just report it. I didn't I didn't know I was required to do more than mm -hmm. that. And so, if you look at my screen right now, we're still in Advisory 21. One. Uh, excuse advisory me, advisory one. one. I'm, yeah. I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to get to 21 so bad, but <laughs> we're on advisory opinion one. And if you start at the line item 88, this is what many appraisers do. They say the subject property previously sold for 400,000, they stop. Right. And that's not enough. So it says the subject property previously sold for 400,000 on insert sale date. Now, guys, if you're going to use this example in your report directly from the appraisal foundation's recommendation, don't include insert sale date right. <laughs> because we're, we're going to see somebody do that. Please don't yeah, do that. that the subject happened. property previously, previously sold for $400,000 on January 1st, 2016. Based on discussions with the owner and a review, the prior sale appears to have been an arm's length transaction. Mm -hmm. Guys, if you look in each one of these examples, somewhere it's going to say arm's length or appears not to be. The prior sale uh, was considered to be a market value transaction because that's the question that's being asked of you. So if you really start your sentence by saying something like, an analysis of the prior sale revealed, well, what did it reveal? It was a consequence of a divorce and therefore not indicative of an arm's length transaction or the prior, the analysis revealed, whatever it revealed for, you fill in the blank. But guys, this is a common problem. And whether you hire Tim or Diana or myself to try to help get you out of trouble, if you're in, in the trouble, if you, I mean, this is, this is hard to defend. In, in fact, it's really impossible because you either put the stuff in there or you didn't. I mean, you either have the results of your analysis in there or you don't. We can't magically make something appear. Okay. Um, can I, ahead, can I Diane. add one more thing? You bet. You bet. One, what you were showing, which is so great, because that was another part of the changes. They elaborated by showing us more illustrations and by saying, you know, these are examples of what you need to be saying. Mm -hmm. But in terms of you, you brought up earlier the word transfers, are transfers really part of USPAP? So if you go to advisory four, the uh, again, this is an advisory opinion, but if we go to advisory opinion four, let me see. You want me to do it or you want to? Either way, I'm there. Okay. Uh, all right. If you're there, then I'll let you do it. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm a, there you, you go. Okay. All right. You see it? All right. Yeah. If you look under advice from the ASB on the issue, and the issue 
uh, has to do with foreclosures. Do foreclosures have to be analyzed? Or must a transfer of title in lieu of a foreclosure, we call them here in Louisiana, dash en paiement, but... Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Say that again. Dash en paiement. I love that. Which is, uh, a, we operate under a civil code, so we're still under Napoleonic law, but it means the same thing. And for short, they call them Dachon. Uh, and that's a deed in lieu of foreclosure. And they're saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm going under, will you take the property back? There's nothing I can do. I'm not going to be, you know, I don't need a workout, but I need some kind of grace and forgiveness. And so uh, it, it allows them a, a, an easier way of getting out. But if you'll notice what it says when you look at it, it says uh, the question is must a transfer or of title in lieu of foreclosure uh, or foreclosure be analyzed? And it, then if you look at the last paragraph starting on line 14, it says foreclosure sales and voluntary transfers in lieu of foreclosure are transactions grounded in objective necessity. Nevertheless, they are sales because they transfer ownership for a valuable consideration. With research and analysis, the appraiser would be able to report, understand it too, that a prior sale is influenced by undue stimulation or that the sale does not reflect typical buyer and seller motivation. And that's what you were trying to impart, which was, you know, so it shows up, okay, address it, but tell them it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't have uh, an impact on the market value under the market value definition because it wasn't uh, offered in the open market. It was given back. And so I just wanted to bring that sure. up and make that clear. Love it. Uh, uh, but Brian, love one, it. one of the issues uh, that a lot of uh, Frasers raise with USPAP is the use of the word analysis because USPAP does not have a definition of the term. True. So a simple and straightforward definition of analysis is the answer to the question, why? Yes. Why did it transfer? Mm -hmm. Well, it transferred because it was a divorce. Okay. Right. Was right. it an arm's length transaction? No, it wasn't an arm's length transaction because it was a divorce. There's the analysis right there. And that's all the appraiser need to list. It doesn't have to be 12 pages right. of exactly. something that sounds like it was written by a federal judge. Do, the analysis do, is it was a divorce. Uh, therefore, it's not an arm's length transaction. Therefore, I didn't use it as a comparable sale, period. Next sentence. Absolutely. Do do something more than writing it sold last year for 150. That's not enough. I think we'll all agree on that. Hey, I want to show one more uh, change uh, that uh, I like. It's also an advisory opinion. It's an addition of an illustration. Uh, we might we might get some uh, differing opinions from viewers, and I know students sometimes will get excited about this or frustrated or, or not have a good understanding. So I, I wanted to kind of present this real quick and I'm going to do a screen share in just a second. I would like to remind our viewers, it's we're kind of at the halfway mark here and the time just flies when I'm with my friends. So I'd like to remind our viewers that this is the Appraisal Report webinar. We're excited that you're here. It's sponsored by Appraiser eLearning. Uh, the fine folks over there bring you and I together. So I'm excited to be here each month for a free webinar. We normally have these the fourth Thursday of every month. Sometimes we have to adjust that and tweak it. I believe we're adjusting next month. Ben might might verify that for me, uh, but I, I think we may have to massage that date a little bit next month for our special guest. And you're going to love our guest next month, trust me. Uh, but we're glad you're here. We do take questions. So if you want to ask any questions, just fire away. We've got three USPAP instructors in the room today. And uh, also, I'd like to remind you that we record each one of these sessions and the recorded versions are available pretty much immediately upon completion. So if you've got to kind of exit and you'd like to see the rest, feel free to come back in. Or if you want to uh, refer this to a friend so that they can kind of see what's going on, you can certainly do that. So what I want to do is kind of share my screen one more time. And I want to show um, a change or I guess an addition. And before I do that, I'm going to show you these little ovals here because I love these ovals. And I don't know, they're still there right now. If you look at your 1819 edition of USPEP, you'll see them. Uh, but 
I'm, I'm scared they might be taking them away next time. I hope not. I like them. So let's just look at this real quick, and it, it'll be an intro to the change that you're about to see, okay? Um, you can see that these circles are part of valuation services. And if we talk about what our appraisers do on really a daily basis or weekly basis, uh, if you're doing an appraisal or an appraisal review, you're going to fall in this most inner circle. And you can see it says standards one through 10 apply. Now, obviously, if you're a real property appraiser, we would be looking at standards one and two, right? If you're a review appraiser doing an appraisal review, now it's three and four effective January one, right? Uh, so you're in this cir circle, you're acting as an appraiser, you were hired as an appraiser, and you're doing one of these two things. Now, clearly still all the rules apply, the ethics rule, the competency rule, the record keeping rule, all those apply to you as well as the preamble, as well as the definitions. Those are all binding. Now, if you go to this oval here, we're talking about you're acting as an appraiser, but you're not doing an appraisal or appraisal review. So you have USPAP obligations, and we'll get into some examples of that in just a second. And then finally, this most outer box, this is the controversial oval here, I believe, Diana and Tim, it says, don't misrepresent. So your only USPAP obligation in this last one right here is that you don't misrepresent your role. So let me show you now on the next page, this is what's added. This is new to USPAP on, uh, what is this, page 121. And it's just a further illustration. And you can see over here on the far left, it's talking about an appraisal practice. We're still within valuation services. All the rules apply. And here's our examples of what you might be doing. An appraisal with an oral report. I don't know how many appraisers have done oral reports. Uh, when I was appraising every day, and I still do some appraising, I did a bunch of oral reports. I love them. Expert witness testimony. Appraisal with a report. A restricted appraisal. If we fall over to this category, remember you would be in the the second oval. You're acting as an appraiser. You were hired because you're an appraiser. There's an expectation that you're acting in the capacity of an appraiser. Then the rules apply. No specific standards apply. You're not doing an appraisal or appraisal report. But here are some examples. Teaching a course, consulting when acting as an appraiser. Uh, there's a, a developing an educational curriculum. Whoa, I've highlighted everything here. I'm sorry. When you look over to this far right side, it says valuation services when not, not acting as an appraiser. So remember our role? The only role we have is for USPAP is that we don't misrepresent. And they've, they've highlighted that again here. When performing these services, do not misrepresent your role. For example, clearly communicate that you are not acting as an appraiser. Here's some examples, and this is what gets some controversy, guys. I want to get your take on this. Brokerage, consulting when what? Consulting when acting as an advocate. Advalorum tax consulting when acting as an advocate. Now, you can see back over here, you might do tax consulting as an appraiser, which would mean that you still have to be uh, independent, you have to be unbiased, you couldn't do a contingency fee, right? You couldn't be an advocate when you act as an appraiser. But over here, it's using the word advocate, property management, mortgage underwriting, leasing. So it gives you a lot of different options. Guys, do, do you think that this chart is helpful or do you think it's more confusing? I know appraisers struggle with this, taking one hat off and, and putting another hat on. I know personally, I struggled with that for many, many years. What's your take on that, guys? Well, uh, Brian, can you bring that example back up? You bet. Uh, so everybody can see it. I think it's the second one in the third column, uh, consulting uh, when acting as an advocate. Assuming that mm -hmm. you take your appraiser hat off and assuming that uh, whoever you're working with understands that you have taken your appraiser hat off, you can consult with somebody as somebody says, well, you know, I want to list my property. Uh, uh, you're a broker. I want to list my property with you. And you say, okay, let's figure out a reasonable uh, offering price. And then you go back and forth. And finally you say, look, I think this property is going to sell for somewhere between 
325 and 350. So let's list it at 360 and take anything north of 345. That's perfectly acceptable when you're not functioning as an appraiser and you are functioning as an advocate. You're advocating uh, that the your your uh, brokerage client uh, put the property on the market for a reasonable price and then accept a reasonable offer. That's perfectly acceptable, assuming you've taken your appraiser head off. Now, go in the middle column where it says ad valorem tax consulting when acting as an appraiser. If you were to, if a client were to call you up and say, uh, uh, Brian, I think my property is over assessed and I want you to appraise it for purposes of contesting that assessment, then that pretty much says you've got your appraiser hat on. Therefore, uh, you are acting as an appraiser, thus you cannot act as an advocate. So you give the client a, 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 a your opinion of the market value of the property, knowing full well that your appraisal is going to be subjected to an extensive review by the local uh, property or appraiser or tax assessor. Uh, fine. Uh, the issue is you can do that. That's perfectly acceptable. So you can function with your appraiser hat on, or you can function with your appraiser hat off. The issue, and, and, and this goes back to the large circle. Brian, if you can go up one page. The, question the, also, would you repeat for them what page number, Tim? Because we had a question saying we are already 121 and one, 121 and 122. Thank you. Okay. So when you're in that big circle, when you're in the valuation services circle, and it says don't misrepresent, what it means is don't misrepresent that you're functioning as an appraiser. Make it clear that you're functioning as a broker or a leasing agent or something along those lines so that it's clear you're not functioning as an appraiser, therefore cannot be held uh, to the individual uh, 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 rules and standards rules. That's all in the world it means. Absolutely. And, you know, I personally had a problem with that. You know, we we talk about taking a hat off and putting another hat on. And boy, for years when I got in the business and for actually a decade or so, you know, I thought, well, that's impossible because I am an appraiser, by gosh. I, I'd be like taking my head off. I can't tell you, I'm always an appraiser. And, and I finally got over that when someone smarter than me shook me and said, look, <laughs> you can take your hat off and you can act in the capacity of a real estate agent or a, or a registered agent, if you will. I'm a registered agent with the Tennessee State Board of Equalization. Indiana has a registered agency status. I believe Texas, Indiana, remember Texas right. does too. Texas yeah. has yeah. tax, registered tax. Yeah uh consultants and so uh they they announce that they are advocates but they have it, a, yeah right and as, as as tim said i came back to this chart real quick and that that middle chart he said ad valorem tax consulting when acting as an appraiser absolutely somebody calls you they want you to do an appraisal and you can you can do that in the capacity of an appraiser but up here on the right if you look you can also perform ad valorem tax consulting, not as an appraiser, correct? When acting as an advocate, you're, you've got a different hat on here, so that is an opportunity. But don't run that under an appraisal office uh, right. where, where you're doing appraisals. That would be that would be something else, guys. We've got a couple of questions coming in, so I want to I want to ask those real quick. Um, so let me Dan K. Dan K. Ask uh, he wants you to cover the changes on intended use and user. So can we do that for a minute? We can. I think I'm scrolling, for, I'm scrolling up to the document. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so Diana, go, go right. ahead. Go ahead. Take that. Oh, I'm just typing it in. Oh. You know, and, and while she's pulling that up, I'll tell you guys viewing. Yeah, you know, I have, we need to, we I need have, to look at it. I mean, listen, I have a hard copy, and I know these documents are very expensive. I, I, I understand it, okay? I but but how do you know what's in here unless you read it? <laughs> you know, right? One, one thing you better be careful of if you're in front of your regulatory board or if you're in in a court of law, and someone says you wrote 
your appraisal report in accordance you developed your appraisal you wrote your report in accordance to use that you say yes i did they say well great how many standards are there and you're like i have no idea <laughs> how many advisory opinions are there? i don't know what's the purpose of use that i don't know well then how do you know you developed and wrote your report in accordance to it when you can't tell me anything in the book and every appraiser in the country ought to know what the purpose is it's the first sentence of the preamble right so uh, Diana is going to look that up. I have both yeah, a hard I was copy tell you. and I have a digital copy, which is great for searching. You could search that digital copy. Go ahead, Diane. So if you if you are looking at your USPAP document, this edition, and you look at the changes that the first time they address this on the intended user is uh, again within the assignment conditions. Uh, the board also adopted those revisions to clarify the definition of an assignment intended use and intended user. One of the issues that came up was uh, how, for instance, in a restricted appraisal report, can there be more than one intended user? That seemed to cause a lot of questions that came about. And I, the, the easiest way I can explain that is that if, uh, if two parties own a house and they are trying to get an idea of what that house is worth, even though there are two parties, uh, they are acting as one. And so you can have assignments with restricted communication that addresses parties that are acting as one. So I, I don't know if this is what the uh, appraiser that was asking the questions was asking, but that seemed to be uh, one of the discussions. And it certainly is in one of the newer FAQs that we had to try to bring that up. Uh, another question that sometimes come up is, can you have more than one intended use in the same appraisal assignment? And the answer is yes, you, you can. And it, but it has to be stated. Uh, and, and you have to make sure that when you are stating such, uh, that there's a clarification for what the uses are. Um, Yesterday, a couple of days ago, uh, I was asked to help this appraiser ask me. They said, this is going to court. It's a divorce. Uh, you know, uh, they both own the property, but the uh, attorney asked for this on behalf of the husband. So, you know, who's the intended user here? Well, it, the uh the question I asked was, are you representing both the husband and the wife? Because once there is this dissolvement or, you know, the separation of, of matrimonial regime, you know, are we talking about two entities? Both own the property, but there is a division of assets that come along. And so the appraiser said, well, I'm really not sure. And I say, well, you need to find out, you know, because you, the attorney is the, is the acting as a representative of the client and the client is the appraiser's client. So who's the intended user? That has to be very clear because often in uh, a divorce, you will find that they'll say, okay, we'll agree to use the same appraiser and everybody's agreeing to that until the appraisal comes in and then the person who wants to keep the house and buy out the other party says well i don't think that's right at all so then they'll get their appraiser so you have to make that really clear at the time of the assignment um, you know it's the appraiser who's going to state who that user is but it's in communication with the client and, and diane i had um I had another question here. Uh, it's, it's relative to a divorce, and and and, and Tim, I may get to since, since you mentioned divorce, Diana. I'll stick with you for just a second. Sherry asked a question, and uh, she's asking, "Can you elaborate on arm's length in a divorce sale? They still Actually, want to sell. They still want to sell at a fair market value. It's a little confusing." Well, I saw the question when it popped up, so I pulled up something, and I'm going to share it with you. Uh, and let's see if I can go over here, application, I think this will 
can you see this now where it says so what is and alt do you see that no i still have no okay let me let me see what i did wrong then i'll cancel this and i will Just screen share application window this is what i'm trying to share is it there now Yes, I believe. Okay. So. so can you, this was based on an article that was written by an appraiser uh, in a publication. And uh, I thought it was very interesting because it addresses the issue that Sherry brought up. And it says, you know, from the dictionary of, um, you, you see this, a transaction between unrelated parties under no duress. Uh, I think that's a key. The removal of the word duress from the previous definition was welcomed by many appraisers because some saw market participants mistakenly equated the terms duress and distress. There is a significant distinction between the two. So now, now, how did Sherry ask her question? Because I'm trying to, all I saw was, how do you? Yeah, she said, can you elaborate on arm's length in a divorce? They still want to sell at fair market value. It's a little confusing. So I think what she's saying is, you know, there are some people that are going through divorce and this is bad. I hate you and I hate you. I never want to see you again. Let's sell this property and get rid of it. Okay. Well, they're probably pretty motivated to sell that property, right? You have other folks that are going through a divorce that says, I hate you and I hate you. Let's sell this thing, but whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's not give away the farm here. I don't want to ever speak to you again, but let's let's not sell ourselves short. Let's sell this for whatever it's worth. We'll split the money, and then I don't have to ever see you again. And so I think that's her question. If you have somebody that still wants to sell it, but they want to get the best price they can, uh, would that still be considered a non-arm's length transaction? Sherry, I hope that's what you're asking. I think if they're trying to sell it to one another, it's not really an arm's length because, and it certainly won't, uh, it certainly won't. Uh, no, I think the question is, they're, they're just trying to sell it on the open market. Then I, I, I think you, you know, the fact that they want to sell it, if they're going to sell it in the open market, then it's behaving competitively. You know, who the sell, does it really matter if the seller is, uh, a broker representing the owners who don't want to get divorced? I don't think so. If, they, if it's going into the open market, Tim might have some other input on this. Uh, the, the challenge comes when the sales agreement comes in, then the, the agent that's trying to represent both of them have to go in and uh, decide. So you might have one that agrees and one that says, well, no, I'm not going to give the the you know, this place away. And, and so sometimes you get into that, but, but when it's open, you know, when it's offered to the open public, it is. All right. We've got another question and we're running out of time. So I want to get to as many of these. I'm going to share the screen because I have uh standards rule two, two B up on my screen right now. And the next question is really talking about that. And I'll let one of you guys handle it if you'd like, but I'll, uh, I'll share the screen. I've got it highlighted really that kind of answers his question. But his question from JJ is asking, if I heard correctly, a restricted report can have multiple intended users provided it's for a single use. I don't think that's what was said. Uh, so let me let me share this screen real quick. Brian, if, if I could jump in. Thank when you're you. dealing with a restricted report, uh, no. In, in fact, if you look at the language, and, and there it is on the screen, the content of a restricted appraisal report must be consistent with the intended use and at a minimum state the identity of the client. Mm -hmm. You'll notice there are no intended users there. Now, you could have more than one client. For example, you could say, you, my clients are uh, Fred, who's getting divorced, and Fred's attorney. Okay, that, that's perfectly acceptable. But the whole purpose of a restricted appraisal report is to have no intended users because there is so little information in a restricted appraisal report that nobody but the client is going to understand it. That's its purpose. So yeah. as a result, JJ, it's an excellent question. And uh, in our sometimes in our enthusiasm, we tend to get a little excited. But no, a restricted appraisal report can has one 
as one client, and by definition, a client's an intended user, but there are no other named intended users. You have the client, although there can be multiple clients if that becomes necessary. Now, could you have more than one intended use in a restricted appraisal report? Yes, you can. As, there, as you can see in the language, there's no limitation to that. Diana, do you have anything on that? No, I, I agree with Tim completely. And, and all I was trying to say was, you know, um, two parties owning the same property can ask for the restricted report. And even though they are the client, they're actually two entities, but they're not separate. They're acting as one. And that's what I was trying to get across. And I think Tim probably illustrated it best. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my interpretation as well. It says state the identity of the client. Now that again, that could consist more of, of a husband and wife, if you will, right. or uh, a partnership, if you will, um, and that the prominent use restriction limits the use to that client. All right, so I don't see any room there for additional intended users. JJ, I hope that answered your question. Uh, I would like to uh, remind everyone that uh, we have a special promo code for an upcoming conference. The NAA, in partnership with Appraiser eLearning, is bringing, to my knowledge, it's the first appraisal conference in uh, Nashville, so we're excited about that. I've been I've been asking the NAA, hey, if you're going to be a national club or a national association, excuse me, you ought to be moving around a little bit. And they finally said, okay, we'll move around. <laughs> and so they're coming to Nashville this spring. We're excited about it. It's April 8th, 9th, and 10th. Mark your calendars. You can get 14 hours of CE credit. Uh, I believe in most states, Ben can provide you more information. And if you're interested in that, I'm going to give you a promo code to save you $50. It's your lucky morning, AEL2018, AEL2018, and you'll get a little discount off any kind of registration. Guys, we're wrapping things up. I'd like to thank my guests, and, and I'll let them each say goodbye to all our viewers. We've had a really good group of folks watching today. And uh, maybe I, maybe we could do a, a round two of this in the near future. Um, if you don't mind, give your contact information one more time, guys, and uh, let everybody know where you're going to be if they could actually come see you somewhere. Go ahead, Tim, I'll start with you. Brian, thank you. Uh, yeah, from a standpoint of uh, where I'm going to be, uh, in the next uh, little while, I'll, I'll be in uh, 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 Wisconsin, up at the Wisconsin Dells presenting a seminar use PAP and a, uh, a seminar on statistics. And then I'll be at ACTS. I'm going to be making a, uh, a presentation on statistics. And because Brian is too humble to toot his own horn, Brian's going to be making a presentation there as well. So we'll look forward to Brian's presentation. And then at the end of April, I'm going to be in uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, teaching the 15-hour uh, use map to some personal property appraisers. And then I'll be around the state of Florida uh, in the rest of the year. But uh, if if you need to get in touch with me for whatever reason, uh, my phone number again is 561-635-5265. And I will look forward to chatting with you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Tim. Diana? Mm, to repeat my number, it's 210 uh, 363 Five nine five zero. You can contact me also by email. Diana D I A N A T Jacob no S at yahoo.com. Uh, I am uh, going to be uh, also trying to make arrangements to attend the same conference uh, that you've been talking about. There's a lot of good stuff, a lot of good people that you're going to learn a whole lot of information from uh, at that conference, and. Um, I'll be in Iowa in April as well. So that's great, what's great. on the agenda. Well, again, I'd like to thank my special guests and, and more importantly, my dear friends, uh, Miss Diana Jacob and Mr. Tim Anderson out of Florida. Uh, it was great having you guys on today. I like collaborating with you, talking regularly. I do want to mention one thing. Appraiser E-Learning is super excited. I brought these two guys in to our production studio in Nashville, Tennessee, and we're working on something special for you guys. We're actually trying to put together a new equipment course, and it's going to be one that you've never seen before. Uh, the three of us are kind of sitting around a table having a little conversation. It's really funny. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
our good friend Dustin Harris had, had called in while we were filming and said, I have a mastermind group and we want to ask some questions. And Tim said, Hey, it's your lucky day. You get three use PAP instructors instead of one. So it was kind of, kind of fun uh, in multiple ways. So uh, we're excited about that. Stay tuned to appraiser e-learning. You'll get more details on hopefully that's going to be approved and released in the very near future. So we're excited about that. Again, I'd like to thank all, uh, all of you for joining in to the appraisal report, a free monthly webinar produced by appraiser e-learning. We hope you come back and join us next month. And just to confirm, we did shift that date to March 29th. So we move that around just slightly, just by a week, but you're going to love it. I've got a really, 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 I'm going to just tease you a little bit, a really special guest. It's on new cutting edge technology. It's going to be fun. Things are going to be flying around. I think you'll enjoy it. So be sure you check out the webinar next month. Until then, you guys have a great week and have fun out there in the field. Be safe. Bye, everybody. And for the guy, one last quick, Go to Advisory 36 for the guy that wants to know more about intended use, intended users, because that is also a new advisory opinion. You should be able to get some really good information there. Goodbye. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed Thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, guys. You.